Uh, all right, our very first speaker this morning is Mike Sullivan, and I have to tell you a story. Mike and I go back to the 90s. That's right, isn't it, Mike? My very first book was entitled 2 Peter 3, The Late Great Kingdom. And it began to be disseminated, and I get a phone call one night, and it was this guy on the line, he said his name was Mike Sullivan, and he just wanted me to know how much that book had changed his life. It was absolutely fantastic. And Mike began calling me over the, I mean, very often, two or three times a week, and boy, we'd talk back and forth and what have you, and just were, were building a great relationship. And uh, one night, we were on the phone, and something was said, and Mike said something about me being of the Reform persuasion. And I said, no, I'm not. And the phone went totally silent. You remember that? <laughs> and he goes, you're not Reformed? I said, no, I'm not. Total change. All of a sudden, the phone call stopped. How long... How long do you suppose it was after that, Mike, that you produced your publication a little bit? Yeah, it was a year or two. Okay. Mike began a publication a year or two after that. And on the opening page, within the first two paragraphs, Mike Sullivan says, the most dangerous heretic in the preterist world is a guy named Don K. Preston. <laughs> now, remember, he's a full preterist by this time. But I'm the most dangerous preterist in the world by that time. And I'm going, wow. And Mike and I didn't have much dealings with each other. I mean, I, I didn't take all that much offense. I've been called worse <laughs> lots and lots of times. But over the years, I began to see a change in Mike's writings. And I'll put it like this. I began to see grace in Mike's writings. And I don't remember what year it was at Sparta, do you? Was that five, somewhere along in there? Yeah, it could have been longer. Anyway, I was speaking at uh, Sparta, North Carolina. And, you know, as the case is, uh, at lectureships, you've seen it here. People are standing around talking, you just walk up, join in the conversation, you just enjoy good fellowship, you enjoy good conversations, and what have you. Well, there was a group of guys, and mind you, I didn't know Mike personally, except maybe just casually. I, I didn't remember what he looked like, really. And anyway, there was this group of guys standing around talking, and I just kind of walked up and listened in, and directly this guy said, you're Don Preston, aren't you? Well, I had just spoken, so yeah, that's me. And he extended his hand and he said, I am Mike Sullivan. And I'm thinking, oh boy, here we go. And he said, Don, I want to apologize to you right here in front of all of these men so that they hear it over the way that I've written and spoken about you. He said, I've come to understand that we can work together. He said, we'll still have our differences, and we do. But he said, I've come to understand that we can, we can work together because of our common bond and our common faith in the Lord. And he said, but I want to ask you to forgive me for the way I've treated you. I said, that is not a problem whatsoever. So we shook hands and agreed. Mike was still a little strong in some of his verbiage and some of his writings. I really, really, really appreciated his scholarship, though. Mike is a really good student of the Word. And a couple of years ago, I was at David Curtis's conference. And he had Mike Sullivan scheduled as a preacher or speaker. And my wife and I were there. I was one of the speakers as well. And uh, I told my wife, I said, I wonder if Mike has mellowed even more. I said, because, boy, he's got some good things to say if he can 
lower the rhetoric a little bit. And believe me, folks, in my younger years, I could skin a cat with my rhetoric. I know all about that. Well, Mike stood up and gave an incredible lesson. Content-wise and attitude-wise, I saw in Mike Sullivan even more of a transformation to an understanding of God's grace. And I turned to my wife and I said, I want Mike Sullivan to speak on our conference. It was a result of that lesson, Mike, and your attitude and your presentation. I had even asked David Curtis, I said, uh, you know, Dave, I see you've invited Mike. And he goes, yeah. <laughs> he says, we're, we're going to see how it goes. And I went up to David afterwards and I said, we know how it went, don't we? He said, man, that was awesome. You will see in Mike Sullivan today the heart of a man who loves God intensely, who does excellent, excellent research. I don't know of very many people who has done more research on the post-millennial view as opposed to Scripture than Mike. That's one of the reasons also why I chose him. So with all of that said, I want you to help me welcome my friend, Mike Sullivan. Well, thank you so much for that warm introduction, Don. And as Don said, um, he has been my mentor ever since 1991 when I was around 21 or 22. So I've known Don for 26 years, and I've appreciated every book he's written. I can't even keep up reading the amount of books that he's producing. And he is by far the leading scholar in full preterism or covenant eschatology today, and we reap the rich benefits of his labors. Uh, Don, I just want you to know that I appreciate even all that you go through personally the last couple months, you still respond to my questions on Facebook. This guy has a work ethic that is beyond anything I've seen, and he truly is a servant. Well, I'm going to be trying to figure out the PowerPoint with this, and I'm going to do my best. But my presentation is the resurrection problem for postmillennialism in Jesus' teaching on the wedding feast and the parables of the tares. <laughs> My main points that I'll be covering, number one, developing the context of God's marriage, divorce, betrothal, remarriage of Israel uh, for Jesus' teaching on the wedding feast in Matthew 8 and Matthew 22. Two, the strength and weaknesses of the postmillennial and amillennial exegesis on these passages, and three, the resurrection problem for postmillennialism as it pertains to Daniel 12 and the parable of the tares. Let me give you a brief testimony on my part. Um, Don says that I, I write a lot about postmillennialism, and the reason why is because it was postmillennial partial preterism that led me to full preterism. And I was at the Master's College, John MacArthur's uh, College, and I was just changing my soteriology, becoming more Calvinistic, and I figured, well, you know, I need to study my eschatology, because maybe there were some things at Calvary Chapel Bible College that they didn't teach me, and I, I really don't know. I'm not confident on my eschatology. So I soon started reading Reformed works, uh, Bettner, um, Burkhoff, uh, just a lot of, whether it was historic pre-mill that wasn't dispensational or all-millennial authors. I didn't read any post-mill at that time. I quickly became aware that dispensationalism was wrong, and I fell in love with amillennialism. Not the amillennialism I think you're used to, which has like a lot of partial preterism in there, but the classic uh, amillennialism that says there's only one second coming in the, new, in the New Testament, and it's future. All right, and this is what we call the two-age model. 
There's this age, which they believe is the church age, and the age to come is just simply when Christ comes, the new heavens, new earth arrive, the, uh, the resurrection of the just and unjust takes place. And it's very simple. On the surface, it's a very simple uh, system. And I fell in love with it because dispensationalism was so complicated. And this was very easy to follow. Well, it wasn't soon after that that I got introduced to postmillennial partial preterism. Quickly fell in love with an article I read in a newspaper by a Reformed Baptist who was a partial preterist. And he just went through the Olivet Discourse and proved that the signs were fulfilled in Jesus' generation. Talked about apocalyptic language, this generation. I said, this is what I was taught in hermeneutics. I've got to know more about this. I found out who the guy was that read the article. I'm very persistent. Um, drove two hours. I want to know what books are you reading. I've got to know more about this predator stuff. So I got the Beast of Revelation, uh, DeMar's works, Chilton's works, uh, Greg Bonson, Marcel's Kick. Read them all. Got frustrated with every time they went through the Olivet Discourse, they only went about halfway. And this is what I really got perplexed about. Coming out of dispensationalism not about a year ago at this time, dispensationalism has a double of everything. A God's plan for Israel, a God's plan for the church, two resurrections, two comings separated by seven years. Amillennialism solved that problem for me, classical amillennialism. But now I'm faced with, and the Reformed communi community is faced with, does the New Testament teach there is one, or are there two great commissions to be, be fulfilled? Does the New Testament teach there is one, or are there two comings of the Son of Man? Does the New Testament teach there, are, there is one, or are two, end of the age resurrections and judgments of the living and dead? Does the New Testament teach there is one, or there are two arrivals of the new creation and the passing away of heaven and earth? And I also noticed that all millennialism was kind of where I was thinking, and that is that the time statements at the beginning of the book of Revelation and the end are like bookends. And so if you're going to take them as AD 70, you have to take everything, and that would include Revelation 20. And Simon Kistemacher and Poitras make this point in their works. All millennialism also sees postmillennialism and premillennialism as teaching Jewish myths. And that was also something I was struggling with. I, I was soon introduced with some really bizarre things that uh, troubled me. I love the preterist stuff, but what was all this stuff about before Jesus' third coming takes place? Before that happens, children are going to be playing with snakes, deadly snakes, and not get bit. The fact that lion tamers are present today somehow proves that the earth is going through some progressive sanctification and glorification process back to paradise. Now, I'm not going to show you any slides of men being mauled as they're doing lion taming or children getting bit by poisonous snakes. All to say, we don't see this. We haven't seen it in the transition period. In the New Testament, we haven't seen it for a couple thousand years. Uh, we don't see animals. We don't see lions and wolves, their anatomy changing, no longer desiring to eat ox and lamb. We just don't see any of this. We don't see men living to be 900 years. And yet these are all premises within post-millennialism that is very bizarre. And I was like, if I'm a preterist, do I have to believe this? Because this is weird. Also, I didn't care for the violence that is present in post-millennialism particularly in Dominion Theology or Theonomy, Reconstructionism. Uh, Dr. Ken Talbot is Sam Frost's mentor and an important board member for Gary DeMar's American Vision. He stated in a lecture entitled The History of Creation, Part 5, when we are in charge, that is when post-millennialists are in charge, oops, yeah, I got it. Um, when the law of God is here, Folks, it's either obey or get hung. Take your choice. Well, you can throw stones if you want to. That's Gary North's view. But there's a better way. 
of doing it by throwing stones. Just quick executions. Because God says you're incorrigible. And you're a blight on society. And you are a road bump that we don't want to deal with in our kingdom. And you're gone. Can, okay, end quote. <laughs> Can someone show me where Jesus ever taught any of this nonsense? Where did he ever teach it? This is the manifestation of the kingdom. The changing of animals' anatomy, the violence, and how the kingdom comes. I just got done lecturing at Berean on the violence of Islamic eschatology, Talmudic Zionist eschatology, and dispensational Zionist eschatology, because they fund that violence. I'm sure glad people on the news and Islam don't know much about this, because they would be using it as a justification for some of the nonsense that they're coming up with. All right, let's develop the context of the marriage. I want to review what the Bible teaches about marriage, look at the Jewish law and customs of betrothal, and then demonstrate how amillennialism and postmillennialism form our view. God's marriage to Israel, we can see it in Exodus 19 to 24, roughly. God delivers Israel out of Egypt, He makes a covenant with her at Sinai. And it's not really until the groom takes his bride to his house, which is the promised land, that I see the marriage as consummated at that point. I know Alan Bondar sees it as a betrothal. I don't, and there's some reasons why. That used to be my position. It's not anymore. Um, there's a threefold marriage covenant, and it's based off of Exodus 21, verses 10 and 11, and Ezekiel 16. I wasn't aware of this. I had a very legalistic view of divorce and remarriage for a very long time, uh, even different than a lot of Reformed folks. And this really helped me understand this. Uh, there's three aspects of the marriage covenant. One, the man, the husband, was to provide for clothing, food, and sexual relations. He would work in the field, give the food. The wife's responsibility was to prepare the food. He would work with the animals, get the wool, her job is to make it, and then of course sexually it was a mutual, mutual deal. We also find out, well, let's go. God ends up divorcing, or when the kingdom is divided, God is married to two sisters. Israel, the ten northern tribes, and Judah, two southern tribes. They are unfaithful to him. He ends up divorcing Israel through the Assyrian captivity, but he remains faithfully married to Judah because through her, the Messiah would come. Hosea 1 and Isaiah 50 show that he's still married to Judah. But in Israel's last days, he's going to divorce Old Covenant Jerusalem. At the same time in those last days, he's going to betroth again in the wilderness and unite Israel and Judah into one bride again. And it's a similar concept. Just the way he divorced Israel is the way he's going to divorce Old Covenant Jerusalem. And in the Old Testament and in the law, an unfaithful wife of a priest was stoned and burned. In Revelation, Old Covenant Jerusalem is Babylon. She's a harlot. She ends up being stoned and burned through the armies that God sends, the Idumeans and the Romans. Let's look at the betrothal process. There are four phases. The wedding arrangement, the betrothal ceremony, the betrothal, uh, betrothal preparation and transition period, which was usually one year. The secret arrival of the groom, the seven days consummation, and the wedding feast. The first phase was the arrangement. This was usually done between the parents. The children could be very young at this point. It was a written contract addressing these three responsibilities of each party. On top of it spelled out the dowry price that the groom would have to pay. Where's the scripture to support this New Testament? Well, in eternity past, the father chose, elected his sheep. He knows them by name. That is, I understand it to be the remnant believing among Israel, the Israel within Israel, and then those in his church. 
And then we know that Christ, the dowry, is his blood. The second step included the betrothal ceremony. Baptism was a part of this. The baptism for the bride was to symbolize a transition period for roughly one year, as I mentioned, as a coming change of status from daughter to wife. New Testament baptism was for, Greek case, I understand, to be a view to, the coming of the groom and marriage, which would bring about the eschatological, not yet, forgiveness of sins or the restoration of all things. John 3, Acts 2, and Acts 3. It also, the betrothal ceremony also included a cup of wine. The, the bride did have a say in this. If the guy had three eyes, she didn't have to drink that wine and say, I agree to be one flesh with you. That's a good thing. Uh, again, the wine represented becoming one flesh, and we see this taught in Jesus' Uh, teaching in John 6, I believe, and also the New Covenant uh, communion, that we take it anew in the kingdom. I know there's a lot of debate within preterism. Do we take communion? Uh, do we still baptize? These are concepts to be debated. I'm just simply throwing out some of these concepts. I'm not 100% sure either way, to be honest with you. There were gifts exchanged. The groom would give the bride a seal, pledge, or confirmatory gift of his love to assure her that he would come again and rece receive her and consummate the marriage. Jesus gave the early church the gift of the Holy Spirit and the char charismata, or the miraculous, as a confirmatory sign and seal that he would return and consummate the marriage face to face. There was also a ceremonial meal which closed that ceremony before the groom would go away to prepare a place for his bride. Again, probably communion. In Acts 2, the disciples were celebrating Pentecost, which was also known as the Feast of Harvest, or the Day of First Fruits. And it was a feast during which the people brought as an offering the first fruits of their grain harvest to thank God, as well as to express their trust that he will bless the rest of the coming harvest. Or perhaps here in Acts 2, you have the closing of the betrothal ceremony, ceremonial meal, and the parting gift by the groom of the giving of the Holy Spirit, his gift to the church, early church. Now that the church has become mature and sees and knows her husband face to face, she no longer needs this charismata, this gift of a pledge, because we have it in full now. And the bride also gave gifts to the groom. So we have an exchange here. The dowry, which is Christ's blood, which is more precious than blood and silver, and we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. But from the bride's perspective, she gave gifts. What are the gifts that we give? Faith and repentance. It's all we have. But salvation is of grace. Salvation is of the Lord. And Scripture teaches that even your faith and your repentance are gifts. Thank God. The third phase of betrothal was the transition or preparation period. The groom would prepare a room or a side room, a honeymoon suite, on his father's house. John 14. Only the father knows and sets the time of the wedding. We see this in Matthew 24, 36 and Acts 1, 6 and 7. I was thinking about this. I was like, you know, I wonder if Jesus just really didn't know the day and the hour or if he's just using betrothal terminology something to think about there were up to two groomsmen which I believe were Paul and John I think scripture is pretty clear on that John was the friend of the bridegroom and uh, Paul explicitly says that he's betrothing the church Jesus as groom meets Judah in John 3 and then in John 4 he meets Israel or, or the Samaritans That's, this is totally cool I love this uh when he meets, okay, through John the Baptist, the groom comes, and he's meeting Judah. He's meeting Jerusalem. That's his bride. And they're being restored, getting ready for her groom. 
getting ready for the eschatological marriage that will come in AD 70. Then very next chapter, John 4, we see the woman at the well who had five husbands. I think this correlates to Israel's history. I believe it's a literal woman and she did have five husbands. I think God providentially orchestrated her life to be a teaching tool of this. But in Israel's history, after she was conquered by Assyria, Assyria brought in five different rulers, five pagan Gentile rulers, and they ruled that area. From there, Israel became apostate. She adopted their idols, intermarried, thus producing the Samaritans. It's also cool, I don't have time to develop it, but in Daniel 12, 1 through 4, the old Greek Septuagint says the hour of the end, not the time of the end. G.K. Beale understands this to be an already and not yet of the resurrection, and that's what we see in John 4 and 5. There's an hour coming, and now is. Kenneth Gentry takes the hour that's coming in AD 70, and now is the already between AD 30 and AD 70. But once we get into the resurrection of John 5, which is still Daniel 12, which he says happened in AD 70, the same phraseology somehow means another already and not yet. Remember I was talking about two different doubles of everything? There's a serious problem there, folks. Serious problem. The transition or preparation period continued. The bride wore a veil during the betrothal. I'm going to have to kind of fly through this a little bit. Uh, that's the old covenant law. Progressively, corporately, uh, that veil is coming off, and it would be totally off at the marriage when, God, when Jesus consummated his marriage with the bride face to face in the new creation. The bride, over the next year, consecrated herself and made her own wedding garments and kept them clean in fulfillment of Ephesians and some of these other passages. Um, she was taking off the garments of the old man, putting on Christ, the new man. She was longing to be clothed with the house from heaven, the temple, the new creation. And that is her wedding garment, the righteousness of Christ. The fourth phase included the arrival of the groom, followed by seven days of honeymoon consummation and the wedding feast. The friends of the groom would come. They would shout, the groom's coming. They would blow a trumpet. All sound familiar. It should. Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, Revelation 10 and 11. And the bride and the bridesmaids had their lamps and oils ready. And this is according to Matthew 25, which Gary DeMar says happened in AD 70. As we'll see, that's a serious, serious problem for them. Then we had the sexual consummation and the honeymoon, and the feast came after the wedding or the consummation. And that's the time of the resurrection. Now, let's get into Matthew 8 before I get into Matthew 22. When Jesus heard this, the expression of the Gentiles' faith, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel I have found such faith. I tell you, many will come from the east and the west, Gentiles, and recline at the table, that is the wedding feast of Isaiah 25, 6, and 9, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, or in the resurrection, while the sons of the kingdom, the Pharisees and unbelieving Jews, will be cast out into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Gentry writes of this passage, We read of the uh, faithful Gentile who exercises more faith than anyone in Israel. We hear once again of the people from the east. This time they sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the rightful place of the Jews, while the Jews themselves are cast out into outer darkness. And God is preparing to punish his people Israel, remove the temple system, and reorient, reorient redemptive history from one people and land to all peoples throughout the earth. This dramatic redemptive historical event ends the Old Covenant era. Notice how he uses Old Covenant era instead of age. You'll see them do that a lot. Even James Jordan, when he's talking about Daniel 12, and, and the, he says the end of the apostolic age. Try to, try to debate a charismatic and use apostolic age and see where they take you. 
Strengths and weaknesses. Well, the strengths are obviously that the casting out of the subject of the kingdom is Old Covenant Israel, Old Covenant Jerusalem. It takes place in AD 70. I think we can agree with that. The, uh, the casting out in darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, he says, is AD 70. Well, a good all millennials is going to take you through Matthew and he says, well, consistently, this is one judgment, one separation, and it takes place in Matthew 24 and 25 and Revelation 20. Post millennials don't know how to deal with that, I, I don't believe, consistency with these phrases. What are the weaknesses? And this is very important. Please listen to this. There is no mention of Isaiah 25, 6 through 9, as Jesus' source. Remember, Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. We would think this would be important for our post-millennial friends to develop. This is just proper hermeneutics. This is what I was taught in Bible college. All right? You study the immediate context. If they're quoting or echoing Richard Hayes, an Old Testament passage, you have to go to the Old Testament passage, recognize it, even develop the context of that entire chapter, or maybe even block or inclusio, if it's there, the Isaiah's little apocalypse. And that's what you have to do. These are just basic hermeneutical steps you have to do if you're going to be a responsible exegete and a pastor, writer, theologian, scholar, I don't care what you want to call yourself, or even a layman. This is just our responsibility as God's people to treat God's word this way. Yet they simply will not do it, and they have the same problem at the gathering of the elect in Matthew 24. They refuse to go to um, Isaiah 25 and 27 because it develops the resurrection, and they don't know how to deal with that there. Uh, there is no consistency on Jesus' phrases of being cast out. I mentioned that. Unanswered questions. Why isn't this the fulfillment of the resurrection of Daniel 12 and Revelation 20 and AD 70? that James Jordan tells us happened spiritually. Well, if Daniel's soul was raised out of Abraham's bosom in AD 70, why isn't this that? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Daniel are raised, and they're feasting with us in the kingdom now. It's a spiritual resurrection, Jordan's teaching. I don't know why that can't be applied here. I sure do. The amillennial exegesis, D.A. Carson writes, The picture is that of the messianic banquet. Thank you, Carson. Derived from such Old Testament passages as Isaiah 25, 6-9, Isaiah 65, 13-14. And the presence of the Gentiles at the banquet symbolized the consummation, not the inauguration, of the messianic kingdom. And he goes to my next text, Matthew 22, Matthew 25. Matthew 26, all passages that post-millennials tells was fulfilled, were fulfilled in AD 70. The strengths and weaknesses of the all-millennial view. They're not, thank you, the strengths are that they're going to the Old Testament passage that the post-millennials don't want to talk about, for obvious reasons, because the resurrection is involved. So they're going that step. They're going one step further in hermeneutics. Like I said, they're consistent with the casting out in outer darkness through Matthew 24 and 25 into Revelation 20. Great. What are the weaknesses? Well, they ignore all the time statements, right? They ignore everything that postmillennialists develop up to this point that show us the fulfillment of AD 70. That's a huge weakness when you're uh, misinterpreting this generation and soon, etc. The hermeneutical steps are incomplete, though, and that no work is done on the context of Isaiah 24 and 25 or Isaiah 65, which demonstrates an end time and local judgment and not an end of time or global transformation event. Don did a really good job of that last night, and he saved me a lot of time, actually. Let's look at our next passage, Matthew 22. Uh, where am I in time? Okay. I'm going to assume you know this passage, okay, because I've got a boogie. Um, the postmillennial exegesis of the parable of the feast. Wow. Joel McDermott writes, here the first, okay, I'm going to skip this. Th what they will do is they take verses 2 through 7 when God sends the armies and burns the city. They say that's AD 70. This is a great commission fulfilled between AD 30 and AD 70. 
But I finally got on record Joel McDermott. I looked everywhere for Gentry. Gentry does not cover verses 8 through 14 anywhere. Uh, McDermott, I think, is speaking for that community when he says this is a different Great Commission. So we're back to two Great Commissions. Um, he says that during this post-destructive wedding feast, and then he, he develops that. So uh, I think there's a, a serious problem with this. Um, because there's recapitulation that's taking place. You have... It, let's see, where is it? Sorry. Okay, look at point B down here. Verses 8 through, th 8 through 13. There is an invitation, but there is new information given to us about the same time period that verses 1 and 7 don't tell us about. This re rejection results in the invitation to the undesirables, that is the ten northern tribes, the Samaritans, and Gentiles, as laid out in Acts 1.8. This describes the success of the Great Commission between AD 30 and AD 70. It's not a different uh, time period, a different Great Commission. And let's do what the post-millennialists and the all-millennialists won't do, and let's develop the context of Isaiah 25. But you know what? For time reasons, I can't do that. And Don has done a really good job of that, and I may be able to get into that a little further um, on the gathering of the elect in the, in the Olivet Discourse. The analogy of faith... Or the analogy of scripture hermeneutics. Scripture teaches that scripture inter interprets itself and that scripture cannot contradict scripture. So I've developed a formula here, a logical formula. I'm going to point this, I'm just going to put these up there so if you get the DVD, you can look them over. All right? And I would encourage you to do that to support Don's ministry. I've got some logical premises to nail that down. Real quick, how much time? All right. The parable of the wheat and the tares presents a problem for wow, post-millennialism. Daniel 12, we've been trying to nail down post-millennials for 25 years. Hey, guys, Daniel 12 teaches that all these things, the resurrection, is included during the three-and-a-half-year period, the judgment, and the tribulation. You have to include that. They were silent for 25 years or longer. That's the history behind this. So then we have these four books, Peter Lightheart, uh, James Jordan, and Ken Gentry, and, and Joel McDermott. Uh, Lightheart suggests that the wheat and tares were, the, the parable was fulfilled in Jesus' generation. He doesn't talk about the end of the age, or Daniel 12, obviously. Then we get a commentary by um, Jordan who does say that the resurrection was fulfilled spiritually, progressively, through the Great Commission between AD 30 to AD 70. Daniel's raised out of Abraham's bosom. He's basically stealing our version, our view of the resurrection. Just want to throw that out there. I believe that's pretty honest. I don't want to be harsh, but no footnotes to your debate with him. I just didn't see any of that. That doesn't seem very scholarly or professional to me. Um, so the weaknesses, obviously, he goes to the parable of the sower to develop his concept of the resurrection. When Jesus is citing it in the parable of the tares, he doesn't want to deal with the end of the age. Obviously, he didn't know how to deal with it in Don's debate. One must wonder, how many times does Daniel have to be raised and inherit eternal life? Amen. How many times does it have to happen? Amen. He's raised out of Abraham's bosom, Hades. He receives eternal life, but that's not good enough. At the end of world history, he's got to go back down, get his body, and inherit eternal life again. What kind of nonsense is this? Don, I'm getting fired up. In a uh, Gentry's old position was this is just one resurrection, Daniel 12. And he criticizes premillennial dispensationalism for having two resurrections. Interesting that now Gentry is teaching two resurrections. He's got two fulfillments. He's saying this was double fulfilled. Well, if you can double fulfill the resurrection of Daniel 12, you can double fulfill the three and a half years, the tribulation, and the time of the end. And they don't want to do that because if they do that, their whole preterist paradigm falls apart. And if that preterist paradigm falls apart, their post-millennialism falls apart because they use the preterist paradigm only to get rid of all the bad things 
the tribulation, the man of lawlessness, the apostasy, that's real important, to uphold their, preter, or their post-millennials. And that's not right. Thank you. Four minutes. Well, Joel McDermott comes along and he finally admits that the end of the age and the parable of the tares is the old covenant age. We were waiting for this for a long time. Long time. Someone please admit this. He does. But he doesn't do any work on Daniel 12. So what you have to do is you have to piece together what Jordan is saying, what Gentry is saying, his old view, his new view. Now what McDermott is saying. And when you do, you get full preterist. Especially when you harmonize it with all millennials. Again, some charts. Don't have time to go through this. Um, I have one parallel down here that not many do, and that's because I see Christ coming in Matthew 24, 27 as the sun and the sunlight shining from the east and the west, and that's the resurrection and the, stining, and the shining like stars. And I go to Philippians 2 and 2 Peter 1, 19 to develop that. Ah. Thank you. Got excited. Uh, there we go. Some more. Okay. I, I conclude this simply by harmonizing what all millennials are saying about the parable of the wheat and the tares being the time of one judgment at the end of the age. And they're consistent with these parables all the way through. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, Revelation 20. The postmillennials are telling, this, telling us that this was spiritual and it happened in AD 70. When you combine those two concepts on the parable of the wedding and the feast, the concept of the wedding and the feast, and the parable of the tares and the resurrection and the Old Testament passages that are in view, we get full preterism. Thank you very much. As is invariably the case, when you do your homework, you never have enough time. <laughs> I mean, that's just simply the way it is. If you did not catch, and if you don't have yet a full appreciation for the typology of the marriage and, and the ceremony leading up to it, the betrothal period, that he just delineated, you really, really need to get his outline, his material, the PowerPoints, what have you. You know, we keep saying, all right, I keep emphasizing this because I'm learning this more every, virtually every day, that a failure to understand the typology of Old Covenant Israel, her feast days, her ceremonies, everything about her, leads to a lamentable, failure to understand the New Testament story, not just eschatology, but the New Testament narrative as a whole. And I thought that was just fantastic material that Mike presented there on that betrothal, the waiting period, the preparation, et cetera, et cetera. It's just really, really good stuff.